Hello, this is Troy Harmon, and welcome to a lecture titled Religious Activities in Lee's Army, 1863-64, to Before and After Gettysburg. There are several visuals. It should be uh, educational, and I look forward to presenting it for you. The Integral Role of Religion but any history of that army which omits an account of the wonderful influence of religion upon it, which fails to tell how the courage, discipline, and morale of the whole was influenced by the humble piety and evangelical zeal of many of its officers and men, would be incomplete and unsatisfactory. A statement by Reverend J. William Jones from Christ in the Camp. You can see an early uh, edition below. It's a standard read on religious activities in the southern armies during the Civil War. As is William Bennett's great revival in the southern armies. Lack of institutional control in colonial south. When we're attempting to do history at a higher level, we try to answer the whys and the so what's and deal with the big questions. The big question in academia related to this topic is when did the South become the Bible Belt, and how did religious activities in the Southern armies during the Civil War relate to that? That's a big question that will reoccur and will be addressed several times through the course of this presentation. But an early entry point answer to the question of how evangelical Christianity gains traction in the South later on goes back to when colonization first started. The Spanish and the Portuguese had a strong presence in Central and South America, whereas the English had a stronger presence in the American South. The difference was the Portuguese and the Spanish had stronger institutional control through their churches in, in uh, Central and South America. The reason why is because the Crown and the Roman Catholic Church were unified and missionary outreach was an extension of that. In the American South, where the English largely settled, there were churches, the Episcopal uh, Church, the Anglican Church, but the Church, Parliament, and the Crown were not unified. So there wasn't the same institutional control through the Church in the American South. That would leave, leave a power vacuum which later on the planter class would fill that vacuum. And that will make sense as we go along a little later, but it's an important first step towards evangelical Christianity gaining a foothold in the South. Moving West births many religious sects. When we think of Western expansion in the U.S., we think of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 and the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825 and of people migrating out of New England down into New York and then out towards western New York which would eventually be called the burned over district because of all of the religious pluralism there and then beyond they would follow the Erie Canal setting up industrial towns and cities all the way out to the Ohio Valley and there was a uh, an adage that's been attached to their movement, Manifest Destiny. And it drew from, perhaps, the older pilgrim ideas of that uh, America was a shining city on a hill, the last unspoiled territory in the world, sort of like a Garden of Eden, and uh, that there was a covenantal relationship between uh, the settlers and God and the later notions of American exceptionalism would get wrapped up into the Manifest Destiny. But it was this idea that there was a divine imperative for settlers to claim the West. And they imagined that if they perfected themselves and they perfected the world around them in this untainted environment, that it would usher in Second Advent. Now, Manifest Destiny would lead to and become all wrapped up in the notion of religious revivals, which we'll speak of in just a minute, and two 
Secular outgrowths of that were abolition and women's suffrage. On the tragic side of Manifest Destiny, the vision excluded Native Americans and later on Chinese Americans. Cane Ridge Revival, which occurred in August of 1801 in Kentucky, is very important as a precursor to the religious activities that occur out on the Western Front. And this is, uh, Cane Ridge allows me to talk a little bit about what was going on in the South. We already talked about Western migration in the North, from New England down into New York, out to Western New York, following the Erie Canal all the way out to the Ohio Valley. In the South, those that moved out West, the pioneers, followed a parallel track. They moved from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, west to Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, Mississippi. They were following on the hills after 1838 of Native Americans who were evicted, and this is one of the sad chapters in American history, where Native Americans were forced off their lands and moved to Oklahoma. The Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, and Cherokee uh, were removed from their homeland. Now, following in their footsteps behind them were European American settlers. And they moved out in large numbers, and before they firmly settled, there were just critical mass numbers at different times. And where these groupings occurred, charismatic speakers would speak to them, and it led to religious activity. We would call these revivals. If you go to Kentucky today in the summer months and drive along the highway, certain times of day you can hear public address systems with preachers speaking and inside of tents, and you can hear the audience uh, singing hymns. Those are survivals from the original Cane Ridge Revival. But this would be the beginning of a number of religious crusades that occurred out on the western frontier as people moved west. It was a fear of the unknown and uh, the dangers and the environment and the excitement of moving out into some new uncharted territory. And so people were more receptive uh, to dynamic speaking. They were very introspective and open to listening. And all of this falls under the heading of the Second Great Awakening. And what was the Second Great Awakening? Well, in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, and uh, uh, with a couple of episodes in the 1850s and 60s, there were a series of waves of religious awakenings of a keen interest in spiritual things. And it was very emotional based in expression, particularly out in western New York and then in the Ohio Valley and then and then in Kentucky and Alabama, Mississippi. As settlers moved west, there was slain in the spirit, dancing in the aisles, speaking in tongues, prophecies. And that faith had not been prevalent on the East Coast. In contrast, if you go back to the 1810s and prior to 1820 to a Congregationalist church in New England or to an Anglican church in Virginia, you would find that the pastors who were seminary trained in Europe, places like Oxford, they were steeped in seminary training when they preached. They were not emotional. But the exact opposite happened during Second Great Awakening, particularly out on the frontier where things really burned hot. And why is that? Because the seminary trained ministers didn't go with the pioneers out on the frontier. They didn't want to rough it. And so the pioneers had to draw from their own ranks to have ministers to fill the daily needs of their life cycle, like christenings at births and performing weddings and funerals and visiting the sick. And that tended to be young men who could handle uh, all of the difficulties of the terrain. They needed to be robust in cold weather. They needed to be able to ride a horse in snow and ice. 
And these were 18 to 20 year old men that emerged from their ranks to become the ministers. They were not steeped in seminary training, but they were steeped in energy and enthusiasm. And some of them had a charisma about them. And so they emphasized an experiential relationship with God. Second Great Awakening was characterized by this. And you can see uh, this in this particular painting. This is typical of what Second Great Awakening looked like out on the frontier, where you have a stage that's built like a box, and you have a person that's speaking that has a lot of energy. They're somewhat theatrical. You have people in the audience that are sincerely involved, and then you have others that are there out of curiosity because it's it's the thing that's going on in their area, and they come out and there's a spectacle to it. It's under the moonlit night and the stars, and there's usually campfires built. A lot of people are there. Uh, Second Great Awakening was also marked by religious pluralism. As we look at a, a picture here of a revival in a Methodist camp meeting in North Carolina, this is to reinforce that Second Great Awakening existed everywhere uh, eventually. It was making its way out west, but it also occurred on the east coast as well. It would make its way back and forth. It burned hottest on the, on the western frontier, but made its way back east as well. And let's talk about religious pluralism. Prior to settlers going out west, pioneers going out west, the dominant fates were the Congregationalists, the Episcopalians, the Anglicans. But on the western frontier, the Methodists, the Baptists, and the Presbyterians just flourished. They went from either being non-existent to irrelevant to suddenly the dominant faiths. And why is that? It's because some would argue they were democratic. Now, there are two camps in academia that argue whether Second Great Awakening was a democratizing force or whether it was an anti-democratic force. The democratizing aspect to it was women stepped into the void and exhorted and were more vocal in the churches during Second Great Awakening. And then they took their faith into industrialized cities and brought moral reform through ladies' relief organizations, bringing about public orphanages and public asylums and settlement houses uh, and public hospitals. Women preached abolition and suffrage. They were a major force in all of the above. And the democratizing camp would argue that Second Great Awakening gave them that opportunity. African Americans also found the Second Great Awakening uh, as a way to find a voice. Though muted in the North, African American churches like the AME Zion Church were in existence in the late 1700s. In the South, the churches started to come up in um, in concealed fashion. On Sunday evenings, slaves would gather in the woods and have their own quote-unquote special service. And as they bonded together, they formed the nucleus of what would later become the African American Church, which would serve as an important institution after the war to help African Americans have a voice. Think of the greatest African American intellectual leaders like Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King Jr. and Jesse Jackson Jr. They had ties to the church. There's also the anti-democratic camp that would argue that um, they would argue that Second Great Awakening put restrictions and regulations uh, rather than freedom on citizens. And so I'll address that a little bit later, but I want you to be aware of those two camps. And here's a picture of a northern camp meeting, Main Square of Duck Creek Methodist Episcopal Church camp meeting during service near Cincinnati. 
I want you to notice the speaker up front in the box. That's a feature of these outdoor crusades. And you can see people earnestly gathered around. You can also see onlookers. There were always curiosity seekers, people that were there to see and be seen. It was quite a spectacle, as I alluded to earlier. I want to mention to you, too, that not only do these three faiths, sects, denominations really emerge, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, and the Methodists during Second Great Awakening, but also Seventh-day Adventists and Mormonism come into existence as a result of Second Great Awakening. But abolition, women's suffrage, temperance, which means self-control, uh, which would eventually evolve into prohibition, Sabbatarianism, which is keep the Sabbath holy, blue laws on Sunday. Some of you are old enough that, as you listen here, to remember a time when businesses were closed on Sunday. And that's an outgrowth of Second Great Awakening. Uh, the, these crusades taught uh, the listener that they could perfect themselves and then they could perfect the world around them and that the outcome would be Second Advent. And again, they thought of themselves as having a, a divine moral imperative to settle the West. Now, when and how did the South become the Bible Belt? This is your big question here. And I've put two books that I recommend for you to read. You can't go wrong reading these. Uh, Southern Cross by Christine Leigh Harriman, which won the Bancroft Prize in 1998, and Steffi McMurray's Master of Small Worlds. Pick them up. They're great reads. Harriman and McMurray argue the embryonic beginnings of the South as Bible Belt began only three or four decades before the Civil War. Harriman, Christine Harriman of Southern Cross, contends the idea crystallized as itinerant preachers realized that power within the nuclear family and plantation economy rested with planters, and so adjusted their pulpit message to reinforce planter control over both. They quickly learned that criticizing planters about personal and professional conduct in front of their wives slaves and yeoman farmers led to a pastor's dismissal. Covering for the planter's transgressions, holding him up as the hierarchical standard, assured the pastor's status in the community and longevity of the pastor. Now, Steffi McMurray in Masters of a Small World adds to this in her explanation of when and how did the South become the Bible Belt. McMurray makes a similar argument for yeoman farmers within their smaller spheres of influence in low country South Carolina. Namely, their role of authority was reinforced by the church. Ministers urged slaves to obey their masters even as designated seating in the balcony or standing in aisles visually strengthened the message. Women could exhort but not teach or hold leadership positions. Folks, this is where the restrictions come in. The the camp um, that argues that Second Great Awakening did not have a democratizing effect would point to the very things I'm, I'm reading. Essentially, the church validated a patriarchal society with a hierarchy of planter to yeoman farmer down to women and finally slaves. Stephanie McMurray places this development around the nullification crisis of 1828-1832. She contends the nullification crisis brought the small planter and yeoman farmer firmly under the hegemony of prominent planters and that Christianity solidified the bond. Now this is crucial. She puts her finger on the pulse of the exact moment when Second Great Awakening, or rather, when Second Great Awakening manifests itself in the form of Bible Belt in the South. And it's the nullification crisis. Uh, nullification crisis is when South Carolina threatened to secede from the Union and Andrew Jackson promised to send U.S. troops there if they did and to enforce that they stay in the Union. And this episode um, caused planters as McCurry argues, to become very nervous, they realized in that moment that they didn't have a network of support. So they went to the local churches, McMurray argues, and 
they gave money to the pastor, they made improvements to the churches, they made themselves present in the church, and they visually reinforced hierarchy. They would bring their slaves, have them stand in the aisles or sit in the balcony. They themselves would sit in the most prominent seats with their wives, and then they made uh, sure yeoman farmers were nearby, but in seats behind them. And so there was this hierarchy visually reinforced in the church as a result of the nullification crisis when the planter went into the local church. That's a big part of our argument. Is that the moment where the South started to become the Bible Belt? Read Stephen McMurray's Master of Small Worlds. Okay, the American Civil War was from 1861 to 65. The Civil War comes, reality of loss sets in after a number of bloody battles. Soldiers try to make sense of the loss. And the biggest single loss in a day was at Antietam or Sharpsburg, September 17, 1862 where there were 23,000 killed, wounded, or missing in a single day. And there were a series of bloody battles leading up to Sharpsburg. But I want to make the point to you that the war becomes a reality check. Uh, early on, everyone thought the war would last 90 days, and it was portrayed by recruiters as an adventure. By 1862, particularly by the fall of 1862, it was clear that that was not going to be the case. And then there was the bloody battle at Fredericksburg where Union troops crossed open fields partially covered in snow in December of 1862 and charged over and again at Confederates behind a stone wall on a sunken road at the basis of Marie's Heights where there was artillery on the heights firing down on federal troops as well as infantry at the base of the heights firing at Union infantry. So the war took its toll. There was great loss and the soldiers began to become very introspective on what all of this meant. The Aurora Borealis occurred or the Northern Lights after the Battle of Fredericksburg and the Confederates who were behind the stone wall who had been able to hold, looked up at the end of the day's fighting and federal soldiers were out on a partially covered, snow-covered field after the hard day's fighting and thousands of wounded and killed. And both sides would have looked up and the Southerners in particular would have paid attention, made a connection with the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights and their ability to hold that stone wall. And they saw it as an omen from God. All of the loss that they had suffered up to that point, and the hard campaigns and the suffering, combined with the Aurora Borealis, it was a crystallizing moment. And these emotions that had been welling up in them for a while sort of cemented in that moment. And it spilled over in the form of revivals or spiritual activity in Fredericksburg, Virginia, in the area where they encamped that winter, the winter of 62-63. And you see a picture here of the Baptist and the Presbyterian Church. Those churches still stand today. Some of the earliest religious activity in the southern armies occurred in those two churches. Reverend Dr. J.C. Stiles on revival at Fredericksburg, the latter part of February, commented, quote, at every call for the anxious, the entire altar, the front six seats of the five blocks of pews surrounding the pulpit, and all the spaces thereabouts ever so closely packed, could scarcely accommodate the supplicants, while daily public conversions gave peculiar interest to the sanctuary services. Jones, Christ in the Camp. St. George Episcopal Church. This is a modern view of the sanctuary. Reverend William Bennett recalled a service in the latter facility on March 27, 1863, noting 
At 11 a.m. we assembled at the Episcopal Church. On this occasion, perhaps 1,500 were in attendance, mostly soldiers. Every grade from private to major general was represented. One of the features of the religious activity in the Southern armies in Fredericksburg that winter was paternal bonding. One dynamic to the religious revivals is the reoccurring theme of high-ranking officers showing up at church services. Subconsciously, Southerners were drawn to the theme that its leaders were strong Christian men. This is the ethos that Harriman and McMurray wrote about in Southern Cross and Masters of Small Worlds, respectively. Second Great Awakening also promoted an inward personal relationship with the Creator that in turn fostered personal responsibility, individualism, and self-reliance. To see oneself as God's personal agent on earth is empowering. Such a mindset requires that leadership fall under the same divine authority. Paternal Bonding Continued Mine Run Campaign, late November through early December 1863, 16th Mississippi Prayer Meeting, meeting in trenches along Plank Road. Austin Dobbins recalled, quote, General Lee and General Hill, who were riding the line, came across our men, dismounted, and uncovered their heads and joined the worship. For a moment, perhaps, they were able to forget the war. Paternal bonding continued. It has been a delight to have some high-standing colonel to kneel down before a thousand men and lead them, not upon the field of battle, but in holy prayer, and sometimes as ably, humbly, and piously, as to make you rejoice at the thought that so many of our soldiers had so good a man to go before them. Herman Norton, Revivalism in the Confederate Army, Civil War History. Now we just finished talking about the religious activity in Lee's army around Fredericksburg, the winter of 62-63. But the rel religious activity heightened greatly after Gettysburg. With the great loss that the Southerners suffered, they became very introspective. There was soul-searching after Gettysburg. Bell Wiley stated it this way, Veterans who saw regiments dwindle in strength from hundreds to handfuls could not escape the realization that their chances of surviving the bloody battles yet to be fought were slim. The urge was strong, therefore, to escape damnation and to gain assurance of eternal peace by getting religion. Bell Wiley, Life of Johnny Reb General Order No. 83 After Gettysburg Soldiers, we have sinned against Almighty God and we have relied too much on our arms for the achievement of our independence. General Lee, August 13, 1863. Call for Repentance. Private Azira Boswick, Company D, 31st, Georgia, wrote, I believe we as a nation have incurred the displeasure of a just God and have been exceedingly wicked, and that is the cause of this war. And the reverses we have met with of late have all been for our good, as to make us more humble and to have a firm reliance in him who doeth all things well. If we fail to put our confidence in him, how soon may the tide of success be turned against us? Call for Repentance James Armstrong Dungham, who is the editor of the Richmond Christian Advocate and pastor of Broad Street Episcopal Church, where Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis attended, commented that, Quote, a day of genuine repentance is what we want to see in the Confederacy, a day on which sinners shall cry for mercy on their souls and plead with God not to curse the land on their account. Call for Repentance Private Ted Barclay of Company I, 4th Virginia Infantry, listened to a sermon by Pastor Beverly Tucker Lacey titled, Be Ye Not Deceived, God Is Not Mocked. Lee's army went into winter encampment at Orange Courthouse there in Northern Virginia. John Worsham, 21st Virginia, described the atmosphere of these outdoor revivals. Ye behold a mass of men seated on the earth all around you, and the wild woods under a full moon, aided by the light of side strands. Trees were cut from the adjoining woods, rolled to this spot, and arranged for a seating of at least 2,000 people. At the lower end of a platform was raised with logs, rough boards were placed on them, and a bench was made at the far side for the seating of preachers. In front was a pulpit, 
or desk made from a box. Around this platform and around the seats, stakes were driven into the ground about 10 or 15 feet apart. On top of them were placed baskets of iron wire, iron hoops, etc. Into these baskets were placed chunks of light wood, and at night they were lighted and threw a red glare far beyond the confines of the place of worship. Preachers, Evangelist J.F.J. J. Caldwell of the 1st South Carolina Infantry recalled, quote, The most ordinary preachers drew large congregations. Scarcely a day passed without a sermon. There was not a night, but the sound of prayer and hymn singing was heard. Often two or three sermons were preached at once in the brigade. And if there was none among us, we went to the other brigades to hear. The ministry throughout the Confederacy seems to have felt the necessity of greater exertion than ever before and accordingly sent us evangelists in larger numbers than I ever saw before or afterwards. And so the denominations, the Baptists and the Methodists and so forth, sent their best speakers to these large outdoor gatherings. You see a picture of the 26th North Carolina band. Uh, regimental bands were part of the, uh, the gatherings. They were part of the worship service. Revivals after Gettysburg. The Richmond Daily Dispatch reported in January 1864. The religious interest in the army is unchilled by the cold weather. Meetings are still held in every part of the army, and in many, if not all, brigades, meeting houses have been constructed for their own use, and faithful chaplains nightly preach to large and deeply attentive congregations. Revivals continued. Austin C. Dobbins of Company B, 16th Mississippi Infantry, recorded, and this is from an earlier time, but it still gives us some continuity into the religious activity in Lee's Army. A.E. Garrison, 48th Mississippi, T.L. Duke, or H.M. Morrison, 19th, and C.H. Dobbs, 12th, preach almost daily. And Wilcox's and Wright's Brigade services are held four or five times a week with prayer meetings at night. We have no chaplain. Our chaplain, Isaac Reeves, resigned some time ago. Large numbers of men, including me, are attending services. In our brigade, 40 to 50 men present themselves every night. Now, there were skeptics in the Army about religious activity, and one of them was Edward Porter Alexander, an artillery commander, often associated with supporting Pickett's charge with artillery on the third day at Gettysburg. Alexander wrote, It is customary to say that Providence did not intend that we should win, but I do not subscribe in the least to that doctrine. Providence did not care a row of pens about it. If it did, it was a very unintelligent Providence not to bring the business to a close, the close it wanted, in less than four years of most terrible and bloody war. And while on that subject I will say here that I think it was a serious nightmare upon us that during the whole war our president, and many of our generals really and actually believed that there was this mysterious providence always hovering over the field and ready to interfere on one side or the other, and that prayers and piety might win favor from day to day. One of our good old preachers once voiced it in a prayer. I think it was General Lawton who heard it and told me. He prayed, O oh Lord, come down, we pray thee, and take a proper view of the situation, and give us the victory over our enemies but it was weakness to imagine the victory could ever come in even the slightest degree from anything except our own exertions. Edward Porter Alexander, Fighting for the Confederacy. Another skeptic was William C. Oates, who led the 15th Alabama in their attack against Joshua Chamberlain's 20th Maine at Little Round Top on July 2, 1863. He would write, when we went to war, it was a matter of business, of difference among men about their temporal, earthly affairs. God had nothing to do with it. He never diverted a bullet from one man or caused it to hit another, nor directed who should fall or who should escape, nor how the battle should terminate. If I believed in such interposition of providence, I would be a fatalist. William C. Oates, War Between the Union and the Confederacy. Let's talk about Confederate chaplains. And this is an instance involving Chaplain Owen preaching to Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade at Fredericksburg, Virginia. When the brigade received orders to march, immediately Brother Owen persisted, quote, 
The Lord would not let them leave while interest in the meeting continued so deep. The next morning, the orders to march were countermanded. Jones, Christ in the Camp. Th this quote is an acknowledgment that the officers saw the chaplains as a big part of the morale of the soldiers. One Confederate colonel wrote, It is impossible to quantify the value of such chaplain service. How can we establish the worth of a bereaved family's comfort in the knowledge that a son, husband, father, or brother have been comforted at death and accorded a Christian or religious burial? We simply cannot measure such intangible service. Yet only the most cynical among us would deny the contribution. In a very real sense, chaplains were the morale of the army. Warren B. Armstrong for Courageous Fighting and Confident Dying. Chaplains continued, There are no statistics revealing the number of lives that were saved through the aid rendered by a chaplain on the field of battle. It cannot be determined how often frightened men remained to fight because a chaplain encouraged them to do their duty and by setting an example of personal courage prevented their flight to the rear. But instances of courage and determination were commonplace. Warren B. Armstrong for Courageous Fighting and Confident Dying. Let's talk about distributing tracts. Austin Dobbins, Company B, 16th Mississippi, jotted down in his journal that, quote, tracts are also interesting, particularly come to Jesus, 48 pages, and dangerous delay. The papers are free, but the tracts cost a penny or so apiece. Also, the Sunday School and Publication Board of Virginia alone accounted for printing of over 100 different tracts with a distribution beyond 50 million pages of the same, from 1861 to 1864. The same board would publish and distribute 100,000 camp hymnals during the same period. Harrison Daniel, Southern Baptist in the Confederacy, Civil War History. Now, a point I want to make here is that the steam cylindrical press in the 1840s revolutionized print. It's not a coincidence that Edgar Allan Poe, Herman Melville, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau became popular during that time period. It's because the steam cylindrical press was using steam power to crank out paper pamphlets, books, and so forth rather cheaply. Not only could they crank them out quickly, but they were using pulp paper. Prior to that, rag paper had been used. So it was cheap. They called it the penny press. Uh, a good example would be Uncle Tom's Cabin and the impact it had for abolition would not have been the same without the penny press. So tracts and prayer books and things like that were finding their way to the soldiers on the front line like no other previous war. Another quick point too is when you read an article on the internet it might have been writ written 15 or 20 years ago, but when you read it, there's a direct connection with the person who wrote it. And the first time that that was done in any kind of large quantity was with these tracks, is that you could speak to someone who might be a thousand miles away, and it was the just the printed word and them. Tracks, Bibles, hymnals. Each of the denominations would underwrite different institutions that publish religious tracts and Bibles. The Evangelical Tract Society in Petersburg, Virginia, the General Tract Agency of Raleigh, North Carolina, Southern Car South Carolina Tract Society in Charleston, the Tract Society of Houston, Texas, and the Sunday School and Publication Board of Virginia sold tracts at the rate of 1,500 pages for $1 and were purchased by all Protestant denominations. W. Harrison Daniel, Southern Baptist in the Confederacy, Civil War history. And the pocket Bible, you know, if you were to go back to the American Revolution in the 1770s and early 1780s, no one carried a pocket Bible. Um, if they did, it was a rarity. You might have a large Bible in your house, but pocket Bibles were common during the Civil War. And the reason was the denominations provided them, and they could provide them cheaply to the soldiers because of the penny press. 
prayer books were also handed out by the denominations to the soldiers in the ranks during these large gatherings around campfires at night and, and just in general would come into the camp and pass them around. And, and these gave great solace and gave important had important meaning during burials. A soldier crew, several soldiers, would bury several men in a trench and just before they would cover them with dirt, someone would say, well, we don't have a chaplain here. Does anybody want to say anything? And someone would pull out a prayer book and say, okay, everyone take off their hats. I'm going to read. And this person wouldn't be a chaplain, but they had a book and they would give dignity to life by reading a few lines and the men would uncover their heads for a minute or two and and then proceed. So the prayer books gave dignity to to life in all sorts of ways on the front lines. Spiritual men in the ranks. Uh, Lieutenant George Finley, 56th Virginia Infantry. Finley was captured on July 3rd, 1863 at Gettysburg and imprisoned until May 14th, 1865. During his imprisonment, he decided to become a minister if he survived. He made good on his pledge and eventually became a Presbyterian pastor. Okay, we've entered into our conclusion phase, and we're going to wrap up by looking at statistics and psychology as it relates to the impact of religious activity in Lee's army during the Civil War. First, the numbers or statistics. Reverend William Jones conservatively estimated that in the fall and winter of 1862-63 and spring of 1863, there were, at the lowest estimate, 1,500 professions of conversions in Lee's army. Jones, Christ in the camp. Shattuck's research suggests approximately 7,000 men, or about 10% of Lee's soldiers, were converted in that period, August 1863 until April 1864. And at least 32 out of the 38 brigades were touched by the revivals. Gardner Shattuck, a shield in a hiding place. In 1866, a report from the Baptist colleges and seminaries indicated that nearly 60 former soldiers were pursuing theological courses. Norton states that, quote, the great majority of those who underwent religious experiences became active and faithful church members. This, is, this goes to the whole point of uh, the South being the Bible Belt or becoming the Bible Belt before the Civil War and then the Civil War continuing and amplifying that idea. Also, Norton records that the revivals brought in Generals Bragg, Ewell, Hood, and Joseph E. Johnston, who all entered the church at this time. Herman Norton, Revivalism in the Confederate Army, Civil War History. Okay, we looked at the numbers now let's look at the psychological effects on the army from religious activity and the notion that the religious activity created fearless fighters. A sort of religious ecstasy took possessions of the army in the late year of the war. The behavior of some soldiers exceeded all reasonable human levels of bravery. As each man convinced that he was assisting at his own funeral, marched confidently forward to die for his country. Soldiers ceased to rely on their military leaders. They instead looked for a miraculous interposition of supernatural power on their behalf. George Carey Eggleston, Rebel Recollections. Turning to religion had a noticeable practical effect. Religious conviction created an inner harmony among the ranks that served to bind the soldiers in spirit and faith. Wiley Sword, Southern Invincibility. Continuing with the psychological impact of religious activity in Lee's army and, and specifically how it created fearless fighters. He who fights for an ideal fights harder and dares more than any other man because he has put all considerations of mere self behind. James McPherson, Religion is what makes brave soldiers for causing comrades why men fought in the Civil War. The revivals functioned in this melu as a symbolic cushion against defeat for the disasters befalling Lee's army only strengthened the belief of religious soldiers that the South would receive victory through the will of God alone. 
Gardner H. Shattuck, A Shield in a Hiding Place, The Religious Life of the Civil War Armies. And then Psychological God's Chastisement. Stowell sees Caldwell, a Southern Methodist minister who had a change of heart about slavery in 1865, as the object of both derision and fear among Southerners who were grappling with the concept of God's judgment. Daniel Stowell, We Have Sinned and God Has Smitten Us. So this is a soul searching that was going on in the Southern population about how they were being disciplined by God for the sin of slavery. We continue with that idea, psychological, God's chastisement. Genovese turns to a Civil War era Baptist theologian, John L. Dagg, who compared Israel's violation of God's covenant in the Old Testament with that of the South's violation of slavery. Eugene Genovese, Consuming Fire. Faust portrays Southern religious leaders envisioning of God's plan as transcending defeat and calling for corporate repentance and return to morality and purity, at which time God's chastisement would cease. Drew Gilpin Faust, Confederate Nationalism. Drew Gilpin Faust is the president of Harvard, and she's weighed in on this, this subject as well. Um, so the idea here is that Southerners felt like they, those that were soul-searching after the war, wondering how they fell out of favor with God, and then coming into the realization that it was over the sin of slavery that a segment of the southern population, when they came to grips with this, realized they must go through a period of discipline from God, chastisement from God. Uh, not unlike Moses, who was not allowed to cross the River Jordan and enter the Promised Land. Neither could Southerners until they had gone through this period of discipline for the sins of slavery. In conclusion, Silver Lining, Reverend Rollis wrote, And among the sad memories, the recollection of the great and blessed work of grace that swept through all military grades, from the general to the drummer boy, is the silver lining to the dark and heavy cloud of war that shook its terrors on our land. William Wallace Bennett, a narrative of the great revival which prevailed in the southern armies during the late civil war between the states of the Federal Union. Thank you.